Hello and welcome to this second section of uh, Human Factors as part of our uh, Level 7 unit. Um, I'm going to continue where we left off in Part 1, um, looking at some of the key, key issues. So, just a reminder, um, the concept of Human Factors and the role it plays in accident causation. This session will look more at uh, slips, lapses, mistakes, errors, and violations. So the human element towards accidents. And then also a little bit about how it affects our behavior decision-making process, uh, particularly in emergency or crisis situations. Perhaps we're not as prepared as we need to be, but we'll look at the various factors around that and motivations. So those motivational issues that and theories that affect the way we think. And then finally, as well as uh, the work that you're going to do online, we also want you to look at HSG 48, reducing error and influencing behavior, which uh, a lot of this session is, is based around the key concepts of HSG 48. So to start off with, I thought I'd just continue with the memory a uh, bit as we did touch on in a little bit on the previous session. Um, the concern here in, in terms of memory and reliance on, on memory can, can be down to the short and the long-term ability of a person to be able to take information and regurgitate in, in a particular way when needed. Um, so the idea behind this is to look at how information is transferred from A to B the information that's taken in and the aspects of that in terms of how it's used and what it's used for. Um, within that, we have to consider the limitations around person's abilities and consciousness, particularly in safety situations. So the ability to be able to react without too many areas or lapses. And then uh, connection between the short-term and the long-term memory and the human error and the emissions from that. So um, with what we said in mind, we're going to be talking a little bit later about motivational factors. I just want to quickly touch on this in terms of causation. Uh, we have and we are who we are from previous years of experience and acknowledgement of exposure, should we say, to various situations. And that aspect of life will determine how we react in a particular situation. So there are certain motivational factors that push us down a particular direction. So let's take, for example, if you've had your fingers burned as a result of, say, trying to put a coal fire on and you had to perhaps create a flue and then you turn the gas on to get it going, to ignite it. And in doing so, perhaps the match that you're using struck out. So then you left the gas running went to get another match, and by the time you did that, the gas had built up. So when you do strike the match and get the ignition source, you are burnt in, in a big way, as has happened with my mother. And that's why I'm using that example. I was quite young at the time, and her eyebrows were singed. They were like the smoke was coming off. It's always impregnated in my mind that to, to say, with fire, treat it with some respect. The other side to it from a motivational factor is that sometimes we actually survive these events and as a result of surviving them it has this kind of influence on us in a different and somewhat negative way so if i can get past that particular incident then that would have been the, the time when my number was up i survived it and therefore i'm not now at risk so you can get two extremes in terms of interpretation by the brain as to what motivates you and whether you will treat something with more respect from a safety perspective, or it may lead to violations and, and other aspects. There's then the attitude towards aptitude. So interestingly that I said that, because quite often the, the two are interlinked. Uh, people have told me that the levels of competence have been achieved because of the attitude that they had and also some of the skills may be inert and within them. Um, and some, some of that is because of 
their experiences through life, or it could well be that they have had an inbuilt skill from birth. And that's always something that's quite questionable. But nevertheless, aptitude is measured by uh, a talent that someone might perceive from a different pair of eyes. Um, it could be the fact that you've been so exposed to something so often that it gives you that ability to be able to act and have the aptitude in that situation. Um, so habit forming as a big part of that. It's definitely linked to person's competence because of the um, knowledge, skills, experience and understanding of any given time and uh, situation. And we'll talk about situational reaction later. And it also, within attitude, we considered correct decisions being made, which is important from a safety perspective that you can rely on that. And I do mention later about uh, muscle memory in some respects. So try and create through what I class as mastery. So you do something repetitively so, so many times that you've mastered that skill. And by doing so, when you are faced with that, let's say an emergency situation, then the muscle memory kicks in and you automatically give the right response. And that's the type of thing you need uh, in certain situations. Now, HSG 48 does build itself around these uh, three areas, the individual, the organization, and the job, and the factors around that that influence people. And quite often, there's a lot involved in each area, but when we look at accident investigation, we tend to focus too much on the human error when there are much more factors in, say, the organizational issues and the job issues that perhaps lead towards the key factors or the causation, um, root causation in particular, that made that human error or influenced that human activity as a result of the other factors that were around at the time. So again, we'll explore this, uh, particularly with HSG 48 being so specific, should we say, in these areas. Now, quite often when we're looking organizations, for example, as to some of those factors, um, it is believed that the technical side of it um, needs to be reliable. And quite often it isn't. And that influences decisions and actions. 80% of accidents caused by acts or emissions of people don't just want to say this is specific to the individual that caused their own downfall, their own accident, but quite often it's, it's other things. And that's why we say acts or emissions. It could be negligence on the part of a supervisor or a manager that's allowed bad practice to develop. And therefore there's more to it than just saying that person was at fault. Uh, the typical response to accident is to blame the individual. It is so much that directed. Well, I can understand a lot of that, but um, one, do you want to work for, for a company that has that kind of culture uh, that allows that to take place? Two, shouldn't we be standing back and saying there was more to it just than the individual uh, taking the wrong action or doing something wrong at the time? Hence, root cause analysis is very important when we look at what more could have been done and what can we do in the future to prevent it from happening again. So what I'm saying is that failures are usually much more deep rooted than this, particularly in the organization's culture, the design and method of working, and then management or lack of, should we say, adequate monitoring and supervision to make sure that good habits rather than bad habits exist. So there's a lot of research out there on human factors. I just thought I'd point out the one around ergonomics. But again, when we talk about further reading later on, I don't just want you to look at HSG 48. This example here, the Industrial Guides Document 90, it looks at the effect of ergonomics and human interaction. So consider that and perhaps do more reading and research on that area to be able to understand how the environment, the workplace, those factors uh, in terms of the, the job design and how we do something can influence or increase the risks of accidents. So when I'm saying human factors in health and safety management, what we need to do is, as we do with other things, is come at it from a risk-based approach. 
Now, as you'll know, every time you have an accident, you should review your risk assessments. And the purpose of it should be within the accident investigation to look at ways in which you can prevent that accident from happening again. So it will allow you to then pull together some of the factors, not just the person that was involved in it, but the other aspects. Um, I'll always remember the time that I spent at Yorkshire Copper Tube in which if we had a crane, overhead crane accident or incident, there was an in-depth investigation. And the reason for that is because of the number of, uh, hit, or should we say the history behind this, that led to this culture. Uh, there've been a lot of accidents from overhead cranes dropping the Yorkshire copper tube um, onto work areas and in a, on occasion onto the people, the operators in the area itself. So there was that, then there was the link to compensation, which seemed to be a big driving factor, should we say, in terms of uh, what went wrong, but also um, the cost to the company. So they were from a reactive uh, point of view, and they did a lot of accident investigation. And the focus was as much on the, was the crane at fault? If the crane was at fault, why? So there was a lot of time spent around that. We get an engineer to do a full assessment of it. Then we'd look at the operator to look at the human error and to see whether methods were right or wrong. And they would have to be taken away from production after the accident and spend some time in the training environment so that the competent person that was training them could look at the methods, the ways that they work to see whether they were a contributing factor. And a short report would be produced by that uh, competent person to then help us during our accident investigation. And they were involved in the committee. So there's, there was time and effort involved in that. And then we'd look at the workplace, the environment itself that could have contributed. For example, was vision impaired as a result of the position? Um, let's say some of the copper tube had to be lifted over machinery and equipment. And as a result of the physical objects that are in the way, could they see where they were going and perhaps whilst they were transferring the tube around, maybe they came into contact with something above head height. And therefore that clash was a causation factor. So there was all those areas that were looked at, not just the human element. And I would always remember that in terms of changing my approach to accident investigation, to consider this and ultimately it influenced the root cause analysis after that. But nevertheless, consider the human factors in job design in the procurement so something new that's coming in perhaps that has the potential to cause harm and where error can take place and then involve the workforce and the safety rest this is a big one for me get them engaged get them involved uh, talk through the best way to do things but also review it later on because if you're doing regular training and refresher training it may, may well be that you have a better way of doing things or a safer way of doing things but it hadn't been looked at initially, and therefore there's opportunity to review that and change accordingly. But within that, the ultimate aspect is to choose the appropriate control measures. And it is important to consider what is appropriate because there's not one fixed all kind of approach on this. As much as some companies would want us to do that, um, it is look at the overall, what best suits your individual organization or organizations, and how can you quickly adapt it that best suits and comes under the term reasonably practicable. Um, so we need to look at a variety of different things in terms of human factor. And one of them is failures and the leading issues around or behind while failures take place. So accidents, first of all, are not simply a result of a human error by a frontline worker. We've got to expand it We've got to accept that rather than just finger pointing and blame pointing. Uh, managing human error is not beyond the control of managers. And that's an interesting statement to make, but one I firmly believe in. Quite often, supervisors and managers have allowed back practices to take place. And when it comes to defending, say, compensation claims and perhaps the HSC inspectors coming in and asking questions around the methods of working, um, they will not just take the word of a manager or supervisor, they'll talk to the employees. And that's where they get a better understanding as to what went wrong. 
So if it was human error, it could be that it is through bad practice, and it could be that the supervisor or line manager has allowed that bad practice to become common practice. And therefore the inference is that um, this could have been avoided with the right approach, with the right management of that particular risk. And then thirdly, potential for human failure must be recognized. Individuals are designed, human beings are designed to fail if we don't have enough break, if we're not um, over ex ex exhausted, should we say, and we've had adequate amounts of sleep, then perhaps our performance is at high level. But if you think about that, how often are we at 100% performance? Could there be many other factors that distract us, which is one of, one of the key issues of accident causation? Could it be that we're, um, we have other things on our mind? Maybe we're suffering with stress or mental health issues that detract us from what we need to concentrate on. Or it could just be that wrong place, wrong time. But we have to look at the, the idea behind that to recognize that this needs to be built into our risk management approach. So we assess it, we challenge it, and then we say, uh, in the working methods, do we allow adequate breaks? Have we considered that fatigue and tiredness can cause or increase the risk of errors? And therefore, what are we doing about that rather than just saying the system is in place? Now, I've put that picture in there just to uh, support some of the theory here. Did an inspection last week on a construction site. And when I walked in, I was suitably impressed seeing that uh, board, shall we say, in place that was showing that they had a positive attitude towards health and safety. So I was kind of like leaning towards a tick. But then when I looked into a little bit further, bottom right hand corner there, you might be able to see that there was a, a near miss uh, reporting document that was still sealed in plastic and never been opened. But to the left, there was the accident book and there was two quite serious accidents that had been recorded. So when I said to the site manager that typically for every incident, there's possibly 30 or more near misses. And what you should be doing is monitoring your near misses as a means to prevent accidents from taking place. And uh, that was, you could see the, uh, oh, oh, right, kind of moment. He apologized for that, even though he's had CITB, CSCS, and various courses where he's been on it, focus on this. Hazard spotting wasn't considered to be part of their approach to this. So I thought I'd just, show you that link there to managers, site managers, line managers being at fault for some situations. <coughs> this general idea that we have to accept is that we all make errors. But Einstein's quote there, anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. Um, and some of the ideas of scientists um, where they've had so many failed uh, attempts at doing something before they had won that, that one uh, full moment of success where they've created the right mix. Um, and it requires that entrepreneurial approach in some ways to, to, to build on, on, well, that didn't work, so let's try this. That didn't work, let's try this, and so on and so forth. And that does help as such. But the link I'm going here is there are several way, ways people cause contribute to or mitigate accidents. And I've thrown in an article there from a guy, <coughs> Carl Simmons, who's the Chief Health, Safety and Security Officer at Thames Water. He quotes that um, organizations need to take fatigue management seriously. We are always looking at the psychological impact mental health and state of mind can have on concentration levels, which can lead to slips and lapses in concentrations. Errors often arise because someone is not focused. So that's what I wanted to, to get your mind concentrating on is that it's not just Graham saying this, it's not just HSG48 saying this. There's a lot of information out there about human factors that contributed to incidents. Now, within that, um, human contribution towards accidents failures, wrong decisions that were made, and also the interventions. Um, an accident, a couple of pictures, I hope you can see from it there, 
the before and after. But um, I went to investigate an accident last year and they decided that typically they use a scissor lift. So you probably see from the picture that three quarters of around this barn that was being built had nice green grass all around it, but it was a firm surface. But unfortunately, as you might see, just in front of this area, they decided because of the pile that was in the way that they were going to use that cat. And in that, um, they fitted forks on the cat and then they put this interesting cage platform, but they didn't tie the platform to the forks. Um, if even with the operator being on top standard and all, always providing the right driver technique and operator technique, um, it really was an accident waiting to happen because the platform was not secured in any way to the to the fox and therefore sometimes i'll say a jolt but sometimes um movement of any kind up down left or right can cause the metal on metal to to move and in this case this the polished slide on the fox themselves had added no resistance no coefficient of friction to hold metal on metal. Um, they believe that there was some uh, manufacturing issue. If we investigated that. We couldn't find any problems associated with the equipment itself. Um, we therefore then said perhaps uh, a major contribution was driver error in which the movement up and down contributed to that mechanical movement. But the point I want to me when we look, look at failures is that it's not unusually deliberate. We are set up to fail by brain processes. So at the time of this incident, the driver was doing some calculations. There was no movement going on at the time. He'd already had them in position so that they could put boards and, and literally just hammer them in or screw them in onto those three horizontal um frames so you can imagine the two guys inside that platform and the driver just needed to work out the uh, the pay uh, the positioning the pitch between uh one and the next and the next and so on because they want some draft to get through they don't want it to be side by side they want a little bit of space they don't want overlap and therefore a calculation was needed on width and he was doing that calculation on his mobile phone in the cab and then shouting to the two guys that are inside the platform who were then going to fit it with the correct spacing. So that came out in the accident investigation. And he said at the time he was uh, nowhere near the handles. He didn't touch any of the operating. It just caused or the, the, the machine itself just moved and then the cage fell off and dropped. Now, thankfully, the two guys inside, when it did drop, that three to four meters, um, had small injuries, but it could have been a lot worse, as you can imagine, particularly if it would have been higher up. Um, even so, when we talk about vulnerable people, the guy that was doing some of the work had, um, it was an amputee um, and had his false leg, and therefore his balance wasn't fantastic. And he wasn't, he didn't need to be, but he wasn't really um, wearing a harness and connection point inside that platform. But when we look at root cause, it was very much about the decision made between these guys to just slide that platform on onto the fork and then, that, and then not think about it actually needs some kind of securing mechanism to stop it from moving and sliding around. So come back to the point, we are set up to fail because of brain processes. Quite often we make quick decisions and sometimes those are the wrong decisions. We may not have been aware of the risk. These guys just assumed that that was designed specific for the job and you just had to put the forks in and get on with it. But in reality, they hadn't had any training. They were not aware of uh, the requirements of working at height and the control measures that were, would have been in place. So that wrong decisions and when we're aware of risks or through misinterpretation of situations, that happens quite a lot. 
from an intervention point of view, we need to think about any intervention that we do is required to stop potential accidents or near misses or spots, hazard spotting. So an idea there is, going back to the point I mentioned before, if we do look at near miss incidents and we look at hazard spotting in the workplace, then it's going to influence the way we think, it's going to influence our behaviours, it's going to influence supervisors on their attitude towards getting a job done, and therefore will change our approach and behaviour around, um, which ultimately influences culture to prevent these accidents from happening. Um, there are two key areas that we tend to look at, and HSG 48 does talk about. Latent failures are usually hidden within the organisation until they are triggered by an event likely to have serious consequences. So what I'm saying there is that sometimes from a reactive measure, we wait for an incident to happen, an accident or otherwise, and after that, we then start to learn. So that's what we're meaning by latent failures, whereas what is preferred is um, the active failures. We look at that instead. We know by the level and consequence of an action that we take, that from a safety perspective, we can't afford it to go wrong. And usually in active failures, we identify this in risk assessment and we'll say, this is so safety critical that we can't afford it to go wrong. Therefore, there's no room for error. For error and, and what we have to do is to make sure that everybody is fully aware of these situations and apply the most appropriate safe action. So what happens here is people forget about those higher risk um, potential, and that's where we get these failures. So drivers, as a classic example, um, if I think of faultless truck drivers, um, not looking in the direction of tra traffic. Um, so what I mean by that is maybe I'm, I'm in a racking system and I'm looking at the load that I want to pick off the third shelf. So I'm more focused on that and the load. Once I've got the load on the forks, as I reverse backwards, I'm still looking at that rather than looking in the direction of travel. And it could be that somebody's walking past or in the vehicle, another thought truck is going past, and I'm not aware of that. I reverse and bang into them. Yeah, so, so those kind of things. Uh, control room staff, where they have to think about signals and stimuli that, thing, that trigger a particular action. Uh, quite often, some of the systems are over complex and there's too much information to, to take in. Therefore, when a warning alarm takes place, it may be that the wrong action is taken by that control room operator. And then the individuals themselves, the knowledge, their competence, their experience in making sure that the required action takes place. So these happen too often, and it's more known as an, an active failure, and it usually is a serious incident where we expect higher standards. The latent failures, however, are more about a delayed consequence. Um, and sometimes it could be something that happens further down the line, again, from bad habits. So what we need to do is risk manage it again, think about the plants, the equipment, the design of it, how we interact with it, the training, how we supervise people, and obviously communication. And when we're talking about latent failures, I usually put at the front lack of lack of training, lack of thought around good design, lack of supervision and lack of communication. So again, going back to those three factors, the job, the individual and the organisation, we, we need to build them into it. And I'll look that into the next slide, but thought I'd show you this example from a discussion at the uh, IOSH branch. Um, David did a presentation around um, organisations personal environment and task factors around human behaviour. And within that, he suggested that for some tasks, it was often worthwhile to use checklists that included points where the user was encouraged to stop and think at key stages before, during and after the task. And again, that stuck with me in terms of when I apply my... Um, what I call it when I'm doing an inspection or walkabout prior to doing a risk assessment and I get talking to people and ask them, about, so you've been doing this job for a while and how, how do you do it? And is there a safe system? Have you been trained in it? Is there a supervision that takes place around that? 
how were you engaged in the design of it? And quite often it comes back to me that well, I, I, I've had no involvement at all. Nobody's told me anything. I just know of the risk assessment. I know of the safe system work and I was perhaps trained in it. Um, and what I'm saying there is that you've, had, you've an opportunity missed there if you don't engage and work with people because they'll come up with some of the great best ideas around how to get around that. So if you want to research and look into that more, there's a, a link there you can uh, look into the presentation. So the key factors we mentioned in those loops that come together and the ideal position is the three loops in the middle and that shows that you've got a good balance in all the areas. The key thing that I want to mention here is that too often we investigate in accidents and focus on the individual causing the error, which is the bit in the middle. So those four factors, low skill and competence, tired, bored or disheartened, and maybe medical problems, all other things around that that contributed towards that person's ability to do the job. So those are four factors, but look above and below that. You've got factor six on the job factors, and you've got six or seven on the organizational management factors. So again, it makes it easy for me to do uh, an in-depth uh, in investigation and accident by just considering each of these three factors. Um, was the job designed in a particular way to take account of instruments and equipment? And was there a good interpretation and understanding of how that needed to be applied? On to the next one, constant disturbances and interruptions. So I just asked the question, um, how is it to work in here? Do you get disturbances? Do you get interruptions? Are you distracted at all? And I move on to the next one. Were the instructions not clear or can I see them? And, and can I interpret, interpret them easily enough? Or was it like, um, as they called it at, at uh, the nuclear plant in Cumbria, when they did an investigation as a result of the Japanese waste that, that went wrong. We called it Heinz 67 or 57, whereby the interpretation of the safe system work, there was about 57 different ideas around how best to do that safe system of work and method. So um, that was obviously overly complex and so on and so forth. You go through each of these areas before you then make that assumption around what was probable in terms of cause and don't assume early on that it was solely the individual that was at fault because we need to look at all those factors within human factors these are the human factors the job the organization and management factors as much as the individual that may have caused the error when uh, there are so many other aspects to it so just want to talk now on the those failures and the types of and and look at why people make mistakes, why they make errors and also violations, why they deliberately break the rules and deliberately do something wrong. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So the human error, first of all, the definition around that is the action or the decision, which was not or was made, uh, but typically not intended to. And that led to an action. It involves a deviation from a typical standard or an accepted standard, which then led to the undesirable outcome. And so that's the definition around the human error within HSG 48. And the uh, violation is deliberate. So slips, lapses and mistakes, um, causes of human failure, again, from that, should we say that um, step analysis that shows you on the flow chart there, the human failures, look at areas, look at violations, look at why each of them perhaps contributed towards. And within that, slips and are uh, considered lapses of memory, rule-based mistakes, knowledge-based mistakes, routines, situational analysis, and exceptional. So HSG focus, HSG 48 focuses on those seven areas as much as we we then look at the human failures. And again, I use this a lot to then call, look at root cause analysis when there's an accident investigation. So slips and lapses typically occur in familiar skill-based tasks, such as driving. Slips and lapses can be made by the most experienced, trained, motivated staff. So something happened at the time, perhaps to cause the error. And we need to design this in and think about it. 
and accept that people do make mistakes when we develop uh, a variety of approaches to a system of work. So slips, failures in carrying out actions of a task, um, called actions not as planned. So it made us do something out of the ordinary rather than the expected way. Typical examples of these, um, a switch, and there was options on the switch, and rather than pressing the right switch, maybe they press the wrong one, or they went in the wrong direction, dependent on the design of the switch. So they turned something off rather than it being on, and perhaps that was safety critical. Uh, picking wrong component from a mixed box. Yeah, so again, if you're doing something repetitively and your brain is in uh, subconscious mode, and it just could be picking something up and moving on to the next stage, not really thinking about it when you've chosen the wrong components. Uh, transposing digits in numbers. This happens a lot, particularly with um, repetition. So um, let's say the the expected movement was always to say one one two one 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 two one 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 two one, and you're inputting that information, and then by mistake you did one two one 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 two one one rather than one one two one. Though those kind of things though we're talking about digits and how these can impact on a situation. And then finally doing something in the wrong order. Yeah, so um, A, B, C, D was expected, but for one day we did A, C, B, D. Um, and as a result of doing that, it may have been safety, safety critical. So there's more to that in terms of slips, but let's move on to typical slips. So here we're omitting steps from the procedure. So we'll leave one of them out um, and by mistake or otherwise, but it's considered a small error, a slip. Uh, performing an action at the wrong point in a procedure. So again, not routinely following it in the right order. Carrying out action with incorrect force. So thinking about how something should be done and rather than applying uh, the force required, it's too much or too little. Performing the action in the wrong direction. Uh, so that, again, could be the brain uh, function that's led you to do this. And for one reason, you go to the left rather than to the right, as would be expected. And doing the right thing or check on the wrong object. Yeah, so uh, going down a particular path and it leads them down a particular decision process. But for some reason, they've chosen a, a wrong object and that's led to... Um, direction, typical slip and follow. So the example in HSG 48, um, two similar name chemicals were being used in this process plant. There was an exothermic reaction that happened as a result of choosing the uh, wrong way in which to do the mix. It's as simple as that. So rather than putting A in and following by B, they did B and that followed A. And that caused the thermal reaction, uh, exothermic reaction, caused the explosion and also a runaway exothermic action, which led to destroying uh, the plant as a result of that. So you can see that that was a serious uh, slip. Moving on to lapses. Um, so causes us to forget to carry out an action. Um, so oh, when we lapse, oh, I forgot, forgot to do something. Yeah, so we, we don't do it as expected. Um, we'll lose our place in the sequence of the task. And when we come back to it, we've missed something. Uh, forget what was intended. So you're so distracted by other things or your mind is somewhere else that when it comes to it, you have that moment whereby you think, what was I doing? And then carry on and maybe pick it up at the wrong point. Reduce this by minimizing distraction, minimizing interruptions and minimizing delays, but also making sure that people have adequate breaks. So when they come back, the batteries are recharged and they're more likely to make the right decisions to avoid the lapses. And we need perhaps checklists, which are great in terms of following procedure and procedures help us to go down routes. And quite often, even when people are competent, they still refer back to these checklists. Yeah, I've done number one, I've done number two, number three. Now I'm at number four. So let's carry on down that route. The example here of the road tanker um, basically, the guy drove away um, without disconnecting. So the fixed pipework from the installation fractured and approximately one tonne of the materials lost as a result of that. 
So he was distracted, telephone call came in, and rather than going back to where he was before, the lapse was he assumed he disconnected and then jumped into the cab and drove off. Um, so again, think about the consequences there of, of the actions. Now, mistakes are a little bit different to errors uh, or types of errors and slips um, as such. So it's typically considered more complex. So the decision-making process uh, leads towards these obvious, in some cases, mistakes. And we do the wrong thing believing it to be right. We, we make judgments within our mind that convinces us that the action that we are taking is in fact right. So that's a mistake, but quite different to an error or a slip. And it involves this mental process that leads us towards making a judgment. So we, we plan it, we assess it, and we make a judgment, and that leads to the action. Um, hence the mistake that can be made because it was improper planning or it was incorrect evaluation of the situation that led to that judgment. Um, these tend to happen in a rule-based environment, a uh, system-driven kind of way whereby we have to do, we have to click go uh, before we can move on to the next. And then when we've gone to that, we have to click another go or yes or no kind of function that is rule-based and it leads towards the next, the next, the next. So what I'm saying is rather than it just being rule-based, there's usually a lot involved in it. Um, and also the knowledge, the competence involved in it, the knowledge-based approach. So it may not be written down and the reliance as a result of this potential mistake, the reliance is, is the knowledge and understanding of the operator doing the task. Um, I questioned um, a tower crane operator once when at ground level, his line manager said, I think it's not that windy and the tower crane operator should go up and do his job. I immediately said, what does the anemometer say? What's the wind scale? So something that's put on the top of the crane that tells us at the ground that the, the wind speed is high or not. And the line manager said, it's broken. And uh, we're relying on the knowledge of the, uh, the the crane operator to make that judgment at ground level and he was saying i'm not going up there it's too windy so um the, the line manager was quite insistent and then the operator turned to me and said i'll tell you what if you climb up there and if you actually make it to the operating position at the top um if you do it then i'll i'll do it i only got up i don't know 20 feet so I'd gone maybe 30 steps at the ladder and I can visualize and feel and take on the stimuli that was around me. And at that level, less than a quarter of the way up on the tower crane, I then knew that the wind levels at height were much higher than at ground level. So I, I then turned around and said, in the future, listen to the operator because he can make that judgment from ground level, even without seeing an anemometer, to be able to judge whether it's safe or not. So um, the line manager wasn't acceptance of this. So we ended up going up. And again, he then went about the same distance as I did before he made the same judgment to say, fair enough, I'm in the wrong. Uh, we'll take on board the, the crane operator's uh, judgment in the future. But nevertheless, there have been mistakes made in several tower cranes. Um, where it's resulted in mistakes, things that they should have done. And they either had too heavy a load or they went beyond the center of gravity and capability of the safe working load in the position of the tow crane itself. Or perhaps they swung around and came into contact with some, something and so on and so forth. So quite often um, crane operators have made mistakes. Rule-based mistakes, going back to the key point there, I'll use that example. An operator was very familiar with the task in filling a tank. He expected the filling procedure to take 30 minutes. On this occasion, the diameter of pipe was different and therefore the tank was filling much more rapidly than anticipating. So he ignored the levels of the alarms that were being put on and assumed them to be wrong and said, no, it takes 30 minutes. And that resulted in an overflow. So um, if there are alarm systems, which in a lot of cases 
uh, in high risk environments, these alarms are built in for a purpose, then listen to them, take account of them. Rather than being rule based, it will take 30 minutes because it always takes 30 minutes. Yeah. So these occur when behavior is based on remembrance or memory rules and interpretation of the procedure around those exposures experience that you've had. And that leads us towards making an in informed decision. In this case, the rule based mistake. And there's a strong tendency to use familiar rules or solutions, even when we're not most appropriate. So again, thinking of where we can get it wrong and then not accepting that we are ourselves in the wrong, the operator or whatever it may be that can lead to these rule-based mistakes. The knowledge-based mistake, so use knowledge-based reasoning in unfamiliar circumstances. There's a need to plan or problem solve because that's how our brain works. Um, A to B wasn't quite right. What went wrong with it? Let's look at that. We might not be familiar with it and we'll try and do something. Well, it didn't work because, rightly or wrongly, let's go back to that and let's play with it. Um, try to think. So I was wanting to pump up the tires on my bicycle and the, the hand pump that I had, it wasn't connecting properly. When I looked at the connection, I should have noticed that it was um, there was a piece missing. And every time I tried to connect it, I was convinced that it was going to be right and it should connect. But then when I started pumping, the air was going out. I was listening to the noise, but ignoring it, thinking that, no, no, it should do the job, but it didn't. So again, our knowledge can sometimes influence us in terms of our expected uh, interpretation of the circumstances. Also, there are people who might be unfamiliar with those circumstances and they try things out to solve the problem. And that, that can be an issue as well, because you've got to think about how people react when they're faced with a problem. What they want to do is solve it. And they may do that by putting themselves at risk, uh, by bypassing a safety feature or taking a guard or removing a guard so it gives them access to it. And by doing that, put themselves more at risk just to um, solve a problem. So let's take a, a big concern I had once. A guy had stepped inside a hopper. The hopper was blocked. He stepped inside the hopper knowing that the blockage, if he could release the blockage by putting his foot on it and pushing and pushing and pushing, that it will release the block. It was paper that was built up. So if he could push that through with his leg, um, it would then drop into the base of it. And then we could carry on getting rid of that blockage. Now, if he'd have been successful in releasing that blockage, um, he, he could have had his leg amputated because of the underneath that we have rollers that are sharp edge rollers that cut in the paper to, to ribbons uh, and then allow, allow it to go through. So he thought, unfamiliar, I have a problem, I need to solve it. Let's climb inside and push and push and push. And then once it's released, I'll be able to see that it's, it's okay. Thankfully, someone else interacted and stopped him from doing that. And when we do a near miss investigation, we then identified that this could be avoided uh, and should be avoided, but it was easy for him to climb into the hopper. So we then need to remove uh, the ladders that were in the area. And that was maybe a, a one means of defense. What else we could do was to put a, a, a distance guard around the top of the hopper I'll put a, uh, an enclosure around it other than the chute that's delivering the papers into it. So we did that as well in that way. And on the guard that was fitted, we also put an interlock onto it. So that if that guard was removed, then the power to the unit was stopped. And therefore it shouldn't start up once the blockage was released. So there's those ideas that need to be considered to prevent these knowledge-based mistakes. And within that, use first principles or analogies. What could go wrong if? You need to consider the variations on a theme. Uh, Murphy's Law, it's not just about promotion to the level of incompetence. The other aspect is, of Murphy's Law, 
if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. So when we say look at the principles and the analogies and what can go wrong, look at ways of preventing the human element, preventing them from making that deliberate mistake and, and making sure and risk manage it effectively. We can also misdiagnose and miscalculate, and that leads to these uh, knowledge-based errors as well. You know, we thought it was in position. We thought that it buying in position, there was no risk, and therefore we pressed the go. When unfortunately, perhaps it was a little bit further away than it should have been, or it wasn't lined up. And rather than the fluid that was coming through, going straight into the uh, pipe system, it was then spraying everywhere as a result. So knowledge base can lead us to misconstrued uh, assumptions. There's also the aspect of not knowing, the lack of knowledge. And therefore, as I was mentioned in the previous one, there is that opportunity for people to take those risks, thinking they'll be okay, and trying things out for their own problem-solving approach. So previous error can occur even if person is trained and even if they're experienced, but they might not have full knowledge of every situation and every potential wrong. And that's when they take the risks. Similarly, the inexperienced, the untrained people who don't have the knowledge or have insufficient knowledge are more likely to make these errors. So an example here, a man was killed when removing the lid of a 45 gallon drum. Now, I shouldn't laugh, but it does seem obvious. Unfortunately for him, he decided to burn off the, um, the top of the drum and inside the drum was flammable fumes. The idea of the thought process is it's an empty drum. Therefore, with it being empty, so they did an assessment perhaps by moving it around and, and assume that the, the fuel that was inside there is now gone and therefore there's no risk. But there was a small residue all inside the bottom and it's not the liquid that's the risk. It's the fumes that lie above it that can cause the explosion. And therefore, when he brought in a significant uh, ignition source, the burner that was being used to cut the top off, then that caused the explosion. Um, the next one is about communication or the lack of that leads to, to the errors. So um, uh, a beach near a nuclear reprocessing plant, there was contamination that occurred in this area because of lack of communication between shift and shift transitions. And it's important that we make sure that there's good handover, should we say, between one shift and another when it is safety critical. So the shift presumed that a particular tank only contained aqueous layers because that's what they were used to. And when in fact, it also contained floating radioactive solids. As a result of that lack of knowledge or not being told or communicated with, that led to some of that slurry being having that aqueous layer in it, then spreading out and causing a major incident. So again, uh, bad communication. And that happens a lot in, in accidents and incident investigation as a key factor. Now, the other aspect that I look at as well is the potential for increasing errors. And you'll see the word stress also, the stress factors, the things that cause stress but also when these triggers come about, lead you away from making effective decisions. And it's not just the fact that someone is suffering from stress. It could be these other stressors or factors that lead towards making incorrect decisions. And I've used this example on a CNC machine in the picture at the bottom there, showing that sometimes the complex um, control mechanisms that are there can lead to these stressors so the design of the equipment, even if you're quite familiar with it, the design of equipment perhaps means that your knowledge of programming and inputting information could lead to errors. So there's those aspects. The individuals themselves can be distracted. The individual can be suffering with stress. Yes, fair, fair enough. Or it could be social or the organization. So it's maybe bullying or relationships that contribute towards that person's abilities to make effective decisions. Or it could be those pressures and overload that means the task demands are pushing them over the edge and they can't focus effectively. But there's also the working environment stresses as well. So think about the hot and cold extremes 
thermal extremes that people suffer from. Think about the environment itself and whether it's doing everything it should do and offering those um, correct environments that lead to good performance, because quite often it does lead to uh, environmental factors do lead to uh, bad performance issues. So what we're saying is with this knowledge, we should influence our risk management. We use that to reduce these errors. We design our workplace and those stressors and try to manage them effectively. So remove it. it. If you think of the hierarchy of risk control, eliminate or substitute is always at the top. So remove those factors where we can. Design equipment to reduce the slips and increase the chance of detecting them. So a good design in a, there are downsides to this, the more complex the design process is to make sure that safety features are built in, the more potential for things going wrong. But let's use the example of um, reversing using a forklift truck. Um, and nowadays, this, this new blue light that's built into the back of the truck, so that when you put the vehicle into reverse, it shows an illuminated area in blue light behind the truck that then says to people in the area, don't enter into this area because I'm reversing. However, that can lead to people thinking, the drivers, the operators of the fault truck, that it's, uh, they are then safe and there's unlikely for them to crush someone against a fixed point because they're not going to go into the blue area. So it changes the perception somewhat. When what we really want is the driver to say, you must be looking in the direction of travel and added safety feature is the blue light, but don't rely on that. We should be saying, you need to look in the direction of travel. So don't look through mirrors, um, always turn into the direction when you are reversing. And that is the key means to avoid these slips and, and errors that can contribute towards um, the incidents. There's the aspect around training as well. So training in a faultlift truck situation, is, there's three key things. You'll go away and get your license or you'll get your license training in basic techniques, either on site or away. So tick, you've got that license. But the other two means of training are done in the workplace. One is around the job. So I'm learning to load the back of a trailer. I'm learning to put things on the... Um, the racking system and learning to transfer pallets from A to B. Those are job specific that a supervisor or a trained person with the right competencies must go through as well. And then the third thing is the differences between the workplace spotlit truck and the one that you got your license on. Um, so rather than it just being, say, the forks being fixed, there might be movement sideways. So um, if you've got a side movement on it, you need training in that. You may use a spike rather than forks. So you've got to be trained in how to detach the forks and put on the spike and variations on that. So the difference is specific to that fault of truck. It could be fueling at the training center where you've got your license. It might have been gas, but here when you go into warehouse, it's electric. So it could be, how do you charge up the electric? Where do you do it? What's the safe system? And so on and so forth. So the variations on that is important. Now, if you applied that approach to all forms of health and safety training in all operations and activities, then um, even though it's not an industry standard or expected, it would definitely reduce the risk of incidents. So uh, basic training followed up by refresher training, followed up by work-based training, and then any variations on a theme around that. And then when you've seen experience develop, you will say, I need to watch you three, four or five times before I can deem you competent. And then you tick them off and sign them off as being fully competent in those areas. So levels of competence increase, reduce the risk of errors. Avoid the need for complex decisions, particularly in emergencies. You know, you want to be simple and effective. So make it that way so that things can be reinforced and done correctly. Supervision, I always preach about this. The quality of the operator comes down to the quality of the supervisor. And the more they know about the job and the right and wrong things to do, 
the more likely they can pick it, these things up and make sure and enforce and uh, discipline people to avoid these errors. Housekeeping is a huge a factor towards incidents and things that can go wrong. So clear the work area, take away those physical barriers, take away some of those messes that can cause issues, slips, trips, falls, and other ones. Make sure that you've thought about that in your risk management program. And then finally, do your risk, risk assessments in a collaborative way that involves people and makes the decisions simple and easy and the best method for that particular job. Violations are also considered. So I wanted to consider within that uh, and give you a couple of examples. Obviously the driving one and the police, you know, we, if we have someone always looking at us, then when we're going to be rule based, we're going to follow it when we're being watched or when a camera is on us, that's uh, potentially going to lead to a fine or three points on our license. So at that time, people tend to drive within the rules applied on the road. But how often is that? Perhaps that's only 5% of the time you're driving. The violations take place when we know we're not being watched or the enforcer's not around. And therefore those behaviors we need to look at. So deliberate deviations from rules, deviations from procedures and deviations from instructions. That's what we mean by violating. Um, there is a need to understand why people break these rules. There are motivational factors. I'll use the example on the bottom right in a second, just to talk about how, how that can be. Most violations are motivated by the desire to carry out the job despite problems. Again, it comes back to this human uh, feeling to I've been hit with a problem, I need to solve that problem. And quite often they will deliberately bypass safety features in order to do that. Now, there is the one more worrying aspect is about the willful sabotage, but those are quite rare. But nevertheless, it could well be that somebody's uh, upset with the company or the way they've been treated by a particular company. And as a result of that, they'll do something deliberately and violate rules just to prove a point or get their way. So that does happen. But nevertheless, routine situation or exceptional circumstances will typically mean that people will follow rules. The hard part in an accident investigation is whether we can specify that that individual violated deliberately the rules and in doing so, perhaps caused their own injury or led to other people's being injured as a result of it. So the picture on the right here shows one example of this. Um, if you look into this, uh, the information that comes from the manufacturer, it does tell you that when you have um, a blockage, and this is a fabric heating printing system. So just to be simple with this, let's say you've got a t-shirt and you wanted to put an imprint on the t-shirt with something else. So you'll get the, uh, I was going to say tattoo then, but you'll get that print, place it on, put this through this, this rollers, it heats it up. And then when it comes out the other end, it's, it's got a permanent um, print on the t-shirt or whatever it is you're printing. Now, sometimes it blocks and sometimes the rollers don't turn around. And as a result of that, what you're supposed to do is follow the safe system. The manufacturers stipulate what that safe system is turn it off, switch, switch it into uh, away from auto into the off position or uh, the operator response position. And when you put it in the operator response position, you can inch it round step by step. And that should be used first in order to clear the blockage. It also says in extreme circumstances, if there is a severe block and it's causing a heat and you can't release it, then what you can do is open the side guard on this. And by when you open the side guard, it should have the interlock um, linked to it. So in the, um, in the picture there, there's an interlock linked to it. Um, <clears throat> you can override the interlock by 
uh, putting a ratchet on the side of this and turning with your hand. Now, that seemed like a, a reasonable approach to doing it. However, it also states that when doing this, do not, or the, the operation must be done whilst it's in the off position. If it's in the auto position, as soon as you release the blockage, then the chain, as you can see on the cogs there, in, and known in the danger zone, will then release, and then it will start to turn around at least once in that. It's stipulated by the manufacturer, and it's given as information in the training. So the operator knew this, opened the side up, put the ratchet on, turned it round, and then it released. And in doing so, it then moved backwards, and the ratchet, as you can see, caused uh, the movement towards the fixed edge. So the ratchet then comes back and then is very close to that fixed edge. The trap point is created because it's very slim. If your hand is on there, as it's been drawn back to that fixed point, as happened in this case, two fingers were trapped against that edge and caused a severe cut. So um, when we investigated, found out that they'd done this. In fact, I, that picture was taken uh, at the time of the incident uh, or just after the incident as part of the investigation, it was still on. So whilst that person went off at first aid and then went to uh, the e uh, emergency response in the hospital, um, they then came back to site three or four hours later. We asked them and they told us that that's what they'd done. They deliberately opened the side up, ignored the rules, and by doing so caused their own accident. So violations uh, come, come about from a variety of different things. This example that's given in here about the Clapham rail crash, um, it just shows how these bad habits are developed and how the poor supervision allowed that to take place. So uh, practices are degraded to the point where it became routine not to use the prescribed method for doing certain tasks. Yeah, and that's the way they've been trained. Poor supervision allowed that to take place. The problems with training and testing meant that the situation was allowed to persist. So the training wasn't effective and they didn't test it out to show that things, if they did go wrong, what it would lead to. So that was, came about from the Clapham, Clapham investigation from that rail crash. So a serious incident there, a routine violation. Um, in the study of Dutch railways, 80% of the workforce considered that the rules were mainly concerned with pinning blame. And I've come across this a few times before where operators think that if they do it in that particular way, then uh, management would then use it against them to blame them later on if something goes wrong. Strange, but it happens. And there you go. Nevertheless, this means that people deliberately avoid things and work out shortcuts, work out better ways for themselves to do something because it gives them the freedom to make decisions. And also it can lead to speed and performance. Therefore they can get things done quicker, get it over and done with and leave work early. Job and knock was one of the key things that I've come across and twice in my career I've, I've had to stop this job and knock approach because it was high risk, leading to shortcuts, cutting corners, saving time, and as a result of that, putting others and themselves at risk. So that's what I mean by routine violations that become habits and lead to these um, bad practices, particularly when they're not, the rules are not enforced. The supervisors are weak and haven't enforced it effectively. So to reduce those violations, it really means up the ante, think about supervision and making the supervisors better, increases the chances of detection by monitoring or alarm systems built into this to so the human error is avoided and the violation is avoided. Um, look at the rules and, and look at ways in which doing better things that will remove those unnecessary rules. Make rules relevant and practical, engage with people and talk to them. Good communication will take that away. Um, emphasize the reason for the rules, why we're doing it, and the importance of it. So that again, they have an informed decisions to make and say, okay, now that I know this, I'm more likely to follow the rules. Think about job design and try to improve it to reduce cutting corners. 
and also think about the safety features that you can put in place to reduce the cutting of corners and always involve the workforce in drawing up the rules because then they have an opportunity to say i don't agree with that it can be done better and safer if we do it in a different way the situation of violations as well so the rule is broken due to the pressures of the job um, the time pressures that they put under they may not have enough people and resources to get the job done or it might be incorrect equipment the example here a steel erector was killed fell 20 meters from a structure whilst it was being erected the harness that he should have worn he decided not to and part of the reason behind that was because of the pressures he was under to get the job done so you know they should have spent time to make sure that it happened it should have had good supervision but he was understaffed um he didn't have the right attaching gear and because of that he chose not to walk so again you can see that the deliberate violation led to the accident but really it was the pressures that they were under and the activities that were allowed to take place that led towards and contributed to the incident itself Again, with situational violations, you can think about how to reduce it. So look at the work environment and try to make it ergonomically friendly, perhaps, and think about uh, thermal issues, too hot, too cold, uh, too much light, not enough light, and how they can contribute to the, uh, the issues of, and, and particularly violations. Or I've, I've not got my torch with it. I know it's dark in there, but I've been in there many times. I know where to go and what to do. Bump, they hit the head. Yeah, so those kind of things. Provide adequate resources. Make it easy for them to just reach out and grab that torch and then use it because it's there. And then when it's not there, make sure that we do our checks and provide that safety uh, feature so it's always there. And when it's not, it's reported. And when it's reported, immediate action is taken to put it right. So provide adequate resources to make the job as safe as possible. Good supervision, not just adequate, but good supervision is needed to reinforce that the, the attitudes the behaviors the aptitude that's needed and the competence actions taken by individuals and enforce and monitor it effectively and discipline people when they don't come back to the design and the planning of the job and make sure it's the best way the simplest way because they're more likely to be adopted and promote this positive health and safety culture so um, get them to believe that if something is wrong that they can report it without being under pressure and being turned away or ignored. Now, the open door kind of policy approach. There are always exceptions, and in certain situations, people make the wrong decision. So again, use the example here. So before the accidents at Chernobyl, uh, the power plant, a series of tests were being undertaken. We did find that there was issues around that. So when an operator failure led to dangerously low power levels, they should have reacted in a specific way and to taken the appropriate action. And in taking the appropriate action, it would have stopped the reactors and it would have stopped that serious incident from taking place. But there was this abandonment, should we say, of things that should have taken place, but they didn't do it. The operators and engineers continued continue to improvise you know, in an emergency situation in an unfamiliar situation. And instead of stabilizing the risk, it increased the risk. So all those bad habits led to an unsafe condition, which was extreme, should we say in this case. When it is extreme and it's safety critical, then there's much more emphasis required to avoid these. They do happen when something has gone wrong in those exceptional circumstances. To solve a new problem, a rule may be broken, even if it involves taking a risk. So in those emergency or crisis situations, we do what we need to do to get past it. And that's where we rely on the individual, the individual's experience, the individual's knowledge, and their ability to be able to make the right decision under pressure in a crisis situation. And that's where it can lead to things going wrong. Belief that benefits outweigh the risk, you know, that I kind of attitude and culture i've got to do it i've got to forget my i've got to be altruistic in some ways uh, not think about the risk to me but look after everybody else and being a superhero we, we don't we just don't need that make sure that the system the procedures 
the way of working doesn't put those people in that position where they have to take action that's violating it in those exceptional circumstances. So more training is needed, particularly in those emergency situations, so that they can practice and practice and practice. When this happens, we can apply it properly. In a fire situation, in an emergency situation, where somebody's perhaps at height and they're unconscious, what do we do? It just becomes second nature that they use the correct and safe behavior in those situations. Identify those particular problems and those violations that could lead to increased risk and build them into your risk assessment system and reduce the pressures on people so that in those situations, they don't make a wrong decision because they have to act quickly. So think about what might they do in those situations. And I put something in there. There is a need to create muscle memory and good habits so that in an emergency, these reactions kick in without really thinking. They make the right decisions in line with the emergency response and the safe system work. So they've had the training, they've got those habits, they've had refresher training that increase those habits, those good habits. And they keep doing that so that when it does happen, it becomes second nature. And those errors and those violations and the variations on themes, how it happens, I think we've covered some of the key problems there, but from HSG 48 point of view, we'll look at these in terms of avoidance. We'll investigate it after the event, and then we'll look at it in terms of more effectively risk managing it. Now, within those violations and attitudes towards work, we've also got to consider the motivation. What makes us work the way we do? What makes us make a particular decision the way we did? And we need to think about why people might violate in those particular situations. Now, I'm going to talk in a minute a bit about Maslow's hierarchy of needs because it's one of the more used, should we say, theories. But there are many other theories that you could consider. Fraud, Adler, Horney, and McGregor. I've used McGregor's uh, X and Y theory quite often, where it looks at why people uh, make certain decisions. And some people think that X is bad and Y is good. I look at it deeper than that and say, let's anticipate that people who are X, who are unlikely to follow rules, who are perhaps lazy, Look at what they do and let's make it so it's very hard for them to get it wrong rather than just thinking the, the good ones, the theory why is who you can bat on the back who are going to be rule based and we'll follow them. Let's think of how we should have things set up so it removes those potential errors, violations and risks. So Hertzberg was another theorist and Within that, we have these motivations and hygiene factors, which are more commonly known in the real world as being satisfiers and dissatisfiers. And when you look at it from that perspective, you can see how it influences behavior. So if I'm satisfied with the way things happen because of these contributing factors, then I'm more likely to go down the right, right route. However, if I'm dissatisfied, these hygiene factors, then they're constantly there and they're constantly niggling at me, it's going to influence the way I behave, influence how I act, and influence the decision that is going to be made that could lead to mistake or violations. So within those hygiene factors, we'll look at the safety and the comfort, but we only notice them when they're absent. So if a guard's in place, um, the hygiene factor is that I don't even see it, it's just always there. But the hygiene factor is if it's removed and it's exposing a danger zone, then that's because it's absent. That's when it influences our thought process. Similarly, on the motivator sides, uh, work elements providing other rewards. Um, so intellectual satisfaction is a good example of this, but there are other motivators that influence the way that we work. Um, so different people have different ways uh, in which they're motivated. You can go to some people and if you can um, make them feel good about how they've done and give them reward by, in, in, in some ways, just saying thank you or well done, that's a good motivator for some. Um, for others, they like to know that when they've been in the wrong, 
that they've been told they consider that to be a motivator. And that affects management technique. And you have to be able to work out who are the types that rely on uh, pats on the back uh, to see them through or who need to be told they're in the wrong. And that's the motivator for them. So there's that aspect, not just intellectual satisfaction, should we say, of being able to achieve and then move on and be able to use the information further as a motivator. But it does influence the way we think and what we have. Now, with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, kind of it's, it's upside down this, but if you look at the triangle at the top that was in the previous uh, slide, so I'll just jump back to that. Uh, you've got to look at number one, which is the psycholo uh, this, this physiological needs that we have to have in place. Hunger, so we need food and drink. Uh, warmth, so we need thermal comfort. Rest, so that we have, uh, we're not tired and we can then absorb information and use it well. We need that basic need covered before we can then discuss things around safety or implement safety features. The next level is security, a roof over your head, knowing that you're going home every night and you've got the roof over your head, you've got clean water coming in, you've got food and drink, you've got sufficient money coming in. And when we're in the working environment and home environment, it's generally safe. I'm not immediately at risk. Somebody's not going to attack me or something not going to fall off something and hit me on the head and so on and so forth. So those basic needs have to be covered first. And so it goes up. So just jump back to the this now. So the hierarchy of needs means that number one has to be covered first before you can go on to number two. Number one and two have to be covered first before you can go on to number three and so on until you finally get to the level five, which is self-actualization. So self-fulfillment or achieving a goal, achieving an ambition or going above and beyond um, in, in, in many ways of working. So all of the below levels have to be covered first. So I've covered one and two. Level three is that working environment that allows uh, friendship to take place. I think about it from a stress point of view when people are not motivated because they're not getting on. So when I've done stress risk assessments, uh, relationships in the workplace come up high as a factor around that area. So the social needs are important. Affection, I'm not, I'm not thinking about being kissed at work or you know, being, being touched and so on. It's not about that. It's, it's a feeling of belonging with your work colleagues and work friends. You know, so it's, it's, that is a very much a social need. Think about this differs uh, in most creatures. Uh, so human beings need social interaction. It's a big motivator for us. There are other animals, let's say, um, apes, monkeys and the likes of, they are a social kind of animal. Lions and, and packs, wolf and packs as well. So it, it's important to have that social interaction. Dolphins are another example of this as well. So we need that, that need fulfilled before we can move on. At level four, it's about esteem and, and being respected for who we are and what we do. Um, and therefore that needs to take place. So um, I'll use musicians as an example and their ability to be able to repeatedly um, play or sing at a, a good high standard. They, they react on people's evaluation, feedback, constructive feedback in particular, but they need to know that they've done well. And that gives them that feeling of self-respect and also respect within their colleagues. If you don't provide that in the working environment and there's not that collective respect, it can quite easily lead to demotivate people and they can switch off and, and not do their job as effectively. So self-esteem is important, being recognized for what they do. Yeah, it's simple. But then the self-fulfillment is, as I mentioned before, is the achievement of goals. But we have to have one, two, three, and four in place before we can get to the top. So all I'm saying is that performance is affected by all these factors. And sometimes we can't do much about some of the basic needs. But in the workplace, we can look at it from a welfare point of view. Um, we can make sure there's a nice canteen for people to have adequate rest, uh, get something to eat and drink. 
Yeah, we can do that in the workplace. We can make the place safe mentally and physically in the workplace, make them feel good about their own personal health as well as the environment they're working in. And we can react to people's needs and so on and so forth. We can do some things about relationships, but it does come down to the individual being uh, give and take. So again, it might be that in a social environment, you've got to work on those relationships and maybe get a manager to not come across as a, an aggressive manager uh, and maybe train the manager to adapt their management style differently to that individual because the perception of that individual is they're being bullied. And so there are lots of things we can do in the workplace to try and change or get that culture in place uh, to affect motivation. So what I'm saying there is motivation is a factor towards reducing error because if we are distracted or we're not performing well, it could be that's going to impact on us. Just to review the session, hopefully you got the idea around this second phase, part two, as to human factors in a little bit more depth, particularly when we looked at slips, lapses, mistakes, errors and violations and a better understanding of that. We talked a bit about motivation and the various factors, factors that affected how we worked. And as always, I would say, look at further reading. So just to finish off, when I do say further reading, I obviously want you to have a very good understanding of HSG 48, uh, reducing error and influencing behavior. And in the next session, I'm going to go into much more detail about the various parts of HSG 48. But there's so much more information available you can get access to. And, and I've just picked up the HSC website. There's three links in there. Um, but what I would say is if you just look at the bottom left hand side, of that slide, you can see I've done a, a search on the HSC website and it's come up with, there was actually 20 plus uh, examples are, and all I've done is go into the search engine in HSC and then I've done human factors. And then you come up with this list and what you can do is just click on each part. Some of the things that are in there, like the, uh, the HSC's um, toolbox on um, human factors. So that, that's a good one to have a look at and maybe download. Um, one of them that led me to the right-hand side of this um, was, was the hierarchical tasks that can be looked at around analyzing uh, incidents. And if you look at the, the step uh, approach there, clearing a blockage, comes back to the idea I was mentioned about the guy that steps inside before. Shut down the machine first so that when they do remove the car, and try to get inside there and remove a blockage, it's not going to really uh, mean that the hands or part of the body is trapped as a result of it. Make the machine safe so residual energy that might be inside the machine um, doesn't cause it to become unsafe. And let's say it's a press and by switching it off, what you need to do is perhaps put a chock between the press that's coming down so it stops it physically from being able to drop down and crush against part of the body that's inside. If you've got the machine shut down, de-energized and a chock in place, then you remove the blockage. So you do what you need to do, knowing that it's in a safe state. Then when you've removed the blockage, you take the chock out, you clean it up the area, you uh, put the guard back in place, you re-energize it and put it back on and restart the machine. So you can see that there's a logical approach that will take out a lot of those errors, those mistakes that can take place, the human factor that leads towards these incidents. So thanks for uh, listening to my session. As always, like I said, part three of human factors is to focus on HSG 48 and the further research involved in that.